So hello, everybody. I'm uh, Jim Hicks, executive editor of the Massachusetts Review, and I just wanted to welcome everybody to our uh, launch event for our climate crisis issue. It uh, should be out in basically about a week, and uh, and we're really happy to uh, to bring this great um, group of readers to you this evening. I should also start by at least a brief land acknowledgement. Um, the University of Massachusetts is situated on the land, unceded land of the Nonatuck and Pocomtuck peoples with, let's see, the Abenaki, the Mohegan, the Nipmunk, the Narragansett, um, and probably others I'm forgetting as our close neighbors. It's in particularly important, I think, for a, a land grant university since the entire land grant system was largely taken um, from native lands. And um, so the question for us, of course, is not just to acknowledge, but also to decide what one is going to, in fact, do once these acknowledgments have happened. And the magazine, of course, um, honors native voices as contributors, editors, at every level, interns, and we will continue to do so. Um, I also wanted to mention it in the context of this climate issue, because if we had in fact honored native voices, we probably would not be where we are today. And if we do not, we may never get out of it. So uh, with that, um, let me introduce or uh, invite uh, Roy Scranton to, uh, to say hello. Uh, Roy and Noy Holland are our two wonderful guest editors for this issue. And, uh, and and Roy will tell you a bit more about the participants and about the issue. And I will disappear. Uh, thank you, Jim, uh, uh, for that. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, showing up tonight uh, in this interspace. Uh, yeah, it, I, it's, uh, it's hard to measure how uh, excited I am about about this issue. Um, there's so much good, phenomenal work here, um, and you're going to hear some of it tonight. Um, and I'm also um, really, really delighted to have uh, our our readers here with us. It's a real uh, honor and a blessing. Um, I won't waste your time with another litany of doom. Yes. Statisticians at the University of Washington recently estimated there's a 95% chance the planet will exceed two degrees Celsius warming. Yes, current trajectories for carbon dioxide emissions match the IPCC's worst case scenarios, which predict will reach global temperature increases of uh, four degrees Celsius or more by 2100, perhaps as early as 2061. And yes, leading ecologists and biologists have warned us that we face, quote, a ghastly future of mass extinction, declining health, and climate disruption upheavals, including looming massive migrations and resource conflicts this century. But let's be honest, uh, such abstractions have never seemed quite real. What does seem real, uh, and certainly seemed real when I was writing the uh, editorial preface for this, volume are names like Dixie, Bootleg, August Complex, Caldor, Lion's Head, Beachy Creek, Holiday Farm, and Hayman. As forests across the West turned into energy, pluming stored carbon into the sky, bloodying the sun half a continent away. Yet, by what name do we call more than 400 million acres of burning Siberian taiga, releasing more carbon dioxide in three months than Germany does in an, an entire year. What sense can be made of the vast planetary transformation we euphemistically call climate change will finally only be apparent in the aftermath to whatever survivor is lucky enough to find themselves picking through the charred rubble of a civilization so many of us publicly despise yet just as desperately cling to. But to get from here to there, could take a hundred years or a thousand. So even that comfort, that fantasy that someone will bear witness and rebuild remains an abstraction. Meanwhile, here we are in the midst of it, or as Frank Kermode called it, the middest, 
with no better option than to keep stumbling backward into the future. As Barry Lopez writes in a talk from 1996, which is being published for the first time in the special, issue, uh, special climate crisis issue of the Massachusetts Review that we're here celebrating tonight and which will be published in a week or so, the best definition I ever encountered of what it meant to be a storyteller in a human society is a translation of the Inuktitut word for storyteller, the sumatak. It means the person who creates the atmosphere in which wisdom reveals itself. Lopez's avowed hope as a writer in nature was that in connecting, quote, the interior landscape of the individual mind together with the shared exterior landscape of the physical earth, it is possible to create a useful and enduring pattern of factual or emotional truth. It's our hope and luck as editors and guest editors for this uh, special climate crisis issue of the Massachusetts Review to have created an atmosphere in which such patterns may emerge. In addition to Lopez's unpublished lecture, we have work from a, a, an incredible uh, breadth of writers from various uh, locations, various stages in their careers, working in various genres. Um, it's sort of, uh, I, I can't read the, the entire list right now. I want to, but, um, you know, in addition to the readers here tonight, we've got uh, Christopher Ayala, uh, Rick Bass, C.A. Conrad, Mercedes Durame, um, Amitav Ghosh, Mariam Haidari, uh, Alex Kuo, Eugene Lim, Sahil Najam, Lehua Taitano, Sarah Vaughn, just so many, so many exciting uh, writers. Um, I, I feel so proud and lucky that we can offer such an embarrassment of riches in the poverty of our common plate. Um, and so finally, just as I promised not to waste your time with another litany of doom, I also won't waste your time with what Jenny Offal called the obligatory note of hope. Um, is there hope? Should we hope? I'll take my answer from Kafka. Oh, plenty of hope, an infinite amount of hope, only not for us. Nevertheless, here we are together tonight to read and listen and share. At the very least, we have that, which is in the end, nothing less than everything. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our readers in the order that, uh, believe in the order in which they'll read. First up, we'll have Joseph Earl Thomas. Joseph Earl Thomas is a writer from Frankfurt whose work has appeared or is forthcoming in Philadelphia stories, Gulf Coast, The Offing, and The Kenyan Review. He has an MFA in prose from the University of Notre Dame and studies English in the PhD program at the University of uh, Pennsylvania. His memoir, Sync, won the 2020 Chautauqua Janus Prize, and he's received fellowships from Fulbright, Vona, Tin House, and Breadloaf. He's writing a novel called, titled God Bless You, Otis Spunkmeyer, and a collection of stories, Leviathan Beach, among other oddities. Next up will be Gina Apostol, who has published four novels. The Gun Dealer's Daughter won the 2013 Penn Open Book Award, Publishers Weekly named Insurrecto one of the 10 best books of 2018. And her first two novels, Bibliolepsy and The Revolution, according to Raimundo Mata, both won the Philippine National Book Award. At the Hotel Serena, the story published in uh, this special issue is an excerpt from her forthcoming novel, La Tercera. Tercera. She lives in New York City and uh, Hadley, Massachusetts. Following Gina will be uh, Shalja Patel. Shalja is a queer, radical, internationalist feminist from Kenya and the best-selling author of Migratude, currently taught in over 150 colleges and universities worldwide. Patel's poems have been translated into 17 languages and featured in the Smithsonian. Her performances have received standing ovations in four continents. It's a lot of continents. Um, honored by the Nobel Women's Initiative with a Global Feminist Spotlight, Patel is currently a research associate at the Five College, Five College Women's Studies Research Center and a Civitella Ranieri, Ranieri 2021 to 2023 fellow. Um, and finally, uh, bring us home will be Omar Alakad. 
Omar is a author and journalist. His debut novel, American War, is an international bestseller and has been translated into 13 languages. It was selected by the BBC as one of 100 novels that changed our world. His new novel, What Strange Paradise, was released in July 2021 and recently won the Giller Prize. Um, we'll, uh, our readers will read and then uh, we'll open it up to some Q&A. Um, I think Noi uh, and, and Jim and I will help with the process. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll have a conversation um, and an evening together. So without further ado, I'm gonna step back myself and uh, turn it over to our readers uh, who I'm, I'm just, again, I'm just delighted to have you all here. So thank you. Um, many thanks. Uh, Joseph, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Roy. Um, and thank you, everyone. I'm happy to be here and excited to, to hear y'all read as well, since um, we all haven't gotten a chance to read uh, everyone's work either. Um, I will just read a short section from the memoir Sync, which um, has a lot of uh, a kind of intersecting parts that sometimes often have to do with uh, ecology, biodiversity, et cetera, what have you, um, in our relationship to uh, non-human things, let's say. Um, and this is from about, about the middle of it. Blackie was technically an outside dog, a black Labrador retriever who, since there was no outside, was relegated to the basement like some kind of wild yet cuddly devil. Blackie was somewhat of a gift a combination of Papa's guilt at being unable to satisfy Joey's emotional need, nor make him strong enough to ignore them, and a neighbor's dog who seemed to always be having puppies, most of whom ended up as strays and were later killed when they bit someone's kid on the face. But Blackie wasn't like that at first. With much enthusiasm, the little puppy was mostly interested in licking Joey's face, wrestling on the floor, eating and shitting. There was something soothing in Blackie's comportment, comportment being another one of Joey's favorite words, Circa, Boulder's Gate, or Gauntlet, one of those overhead party RPG games where such words came up inevitably in a tavern just before you decide whether or not to beat some drunk NPC's ass as she disrespects the women in your party, mistaking them for sex workers or you, a vagabond. Though maybe soothing isn't the right word to describe an animal who grew more wild and more puppy-like as he gained in size. It felt good to hold and squeeze something so large and permanent, nearly indestructible and warm, it didn't take long, though, before Joey couldn't even walk Blackie on his own. No matter how much he begged, it was a joke that someone might lend a hand. You wanted that stupid fucking dog, they said. It ain't my dog. Take care of your responsibilities. And so Blackie spent more time in the basement, the shit and piss accumulating no matter how much Joey tried to clean it up. There were piles everywhere, like when a Digimon pooped in Digimon World, with textures from soft serve ice cream to bricks of ice. Everyone else avoided the basement for the smell for the big dog down there who was now a bad dog because of how excited he was, how desperate for attention, how much need. Joey wished he could stay at home from school and cater to Blackie. He tried to do push-ups to get strong enough to take him out, but it never worked. The more time Blackie spent alone in the basement, the further he grew away from being a pet and more a wild animal. He'd be smothered in his own excrement, all over his face and paws, barking all day and night. Then he'd cry when Joey came down to feed or pet him, He'd cry when Joey left for school. He'd cry when Joey went to bed. The dog rubbed his nose up against the door like little children while the little children slept on the other side, never quite able to become part of the family or sleep in the apartment. But Blackie was sturdy. He survived. It hurt that Joey had to give Blackie away, but he knew it was for the best. At least he didn't die, Joey kept thinking. That Blackie might live a normal life out on a cartoon pasture meant the amelioration of Joey's guilt. At least he didn't die. And as Joey got bigger, he kept wondering if he was yet strong enough to walk Blackie himself and whether he should try to get him back. Was there a court he could appeal to? How long do those dogs live anyway? And even if Blackie could return, would he still feel the same? Joey failed with plenty of pets after that. Fire-bellied newts, two lizards, an iguana, those guinea pigs, red-eared sliders from the highway, sound toads, funny-looking frogs, mice, rats, and gerbils, milk snakes, an angry praying mantis, hermit crabs and a brown ferret. He always knew he'd find more. There were always more animals to touch and to love and to squeeze and to die before their time. Could he learn to love something? It seemed that everywhere he looked, love was not allowed, save for the people who looked like him on television, but were obviously lying about something. Certainly wolf spiders knew better. Joey grabbed two wolf spiders from outside on the patio, the largest ones he could find, and put them in an arena with a house centipede, a few roaches, and a white mouse with red eyes. 
The mouse was only a dollar and the brown mice in the house were difficult to catch and quick to bite, unlike the carefree feeder white mice who mostly shat in Joey's hand or on his neck as they nuzzled up against him. The arena results were unexpected. The mouse didn't do much of anything except back away, a coward. Everyone ignored the roaches. They always ignored the roaches. One wolf spider left and the other attacked the house centipede, grappling and piercing into it as the centipede wrapped its whole body around the spider in a begging embrace. It bucked and whipped against the spider's furry legs until finally, twisting and turning the thing around, they both expended themselves completely. Tired and gnawed on, they gave up slowly. Twitching still, their muscles clenched on each other until all movement ceased. Then the mouse ambled over and nibbled both their heads off. The whole scene was just what Joey might have described as evolutionary, the word he still loved but had come to understand as something inherently bad, depending on who you asked. But he kept staging and watching these arena fights and called himself learning, his age being in the double digits now and having composed himself to no longer piss the bed, he figured that were Blackie around in this very moment, he'd be able to do right by him. And that's when he saw it, browsing the pet store for the last time, the alligator. A dream come true, a whole dragon in the flesh, way up in Philadelphia, somehow an alligator. Something ancient and invincible and real, and only a hundred dollars, and much cooler than anyone he could normally call a pet. He would definitely capture and train it himself as soon as he was ready. Uh, thank you, Joseph. That's there we go. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Um, great. So, um, Gina, you're up. I'll read at the Hotel Sirena. Chinamor dropped drop me off in Tacloban at the Hotel Sirena, my layover, as he called it, before the airport. I had said my goodbyes to Adino, sweet Adino in Salugo. He was tending his chickens. Did you see, do you see that guy, Adina said, pointing at a resplendent bird, Nemesio, the golden laced Wyandot? Golden Nemesio was sitting pretty under a gumamela bush. That's not where he sleeps, Adina said. Something's going on with Nemesio. His hut is over there. Adina was very careful not to speak a word of English to me, using words like bidduan iagin kakaturugan instead of hut. He pointed to Mariano, a stunning speckled figure pecking under an eave. That guy, Adina said, that guy's back is to the river, but usually he likes to run on the A wall. He almost used our childish word for the C wall. It iya ayun pag dinalagan hito nga pader. He stopped. He refused to say A wall. Hmm, he said, something's going on. No one in his. No one is in his right place, my nanana bo. Waray usanga adahalugar. And this one, Adino said, ini hi Francisco. Parag muna hiya ng adahan usa, ito hiya. Mahilig magmulay. Bagapahan ha doa ato, nankuan nga mulay ba? Pamiling, pamiling. This one, this one, this Francisco. He likes to play a game with that one, that one. He loves to play. Like when we were little, you know, and Adino refused to say the name of our childhood game. Discover, discover. Kuan, he said. And kuan ngamulay ba? He hesitated. He grasped for a translation because he knew it. At the tip of his tongue, he had the actual English word. But, but the chicken Francisco, as both Adino and I could see, was heaped underneath a pile of swept up leaves with the other Russian Orlov, Kote. Aging ang mga parayaw, I said. Adino grinned at my waray. Mo pa ito nga bantogera, he said fondly. Mga parayaw. That's a good word for them, he said. And now I have no translation for my term. Like so many words that exist without another's measure, bastilan waso. Paraya. They, they lay there, a pair of gallos, each one with an elaborate ruff, their paraya feathers, a preening set, one collar more russet than the other, but the other with a spangle of imbricating spots so that when it ruffled its feathers, the carefully modeled array disarranged into a blur, 
claret and gold only to flutter back into its gorgeous oculate design. Their yellow chicken legs reaching out occasionally to scratch at the leaves. There's something going on, Adina reflected, reaching out to pet the feathery collar, check Jorge's walnut comb. Mga parayo inihira. The roosters like to strut about, playing and catching each other. But something is happening, he said. He stood up and he raised his chin as if to scan the river with it, sniffing the air, his single mole by his lip marking the moment. I stood there next to him, only up to his shoulders. He was now so tall, my little brother, an akun bugto, an manghud. And I stood there with my suitcase and handbag and absurdly wide straw hat. He was silent, taking in the river's breeze. Well, I have to get going, I said. The jeepney's here. You sure you don't want to come with me to Tacloban to be with us before I leave for the airport? He shook his head. He smiled at his chickens. Adila kami, he said. I tiptoed to kiss him on both cheeks. Pagbuutan, I said. Ikaw gihap. But you're going up to Chinomors, I said, when the storm comes. Their place up in the hills in Santa Elena. It will be safer. He nodded. I'm sorry about the house, I said, that they want to sell it. I hope they don't. I think they're wrong. Ayos, he said. Then his eyes widened. He was grinning. He looked so much like our mom, Adina and Guapa, the expression on his face having multiple instincts at once. Waray makakadara kung diri ako upod. No one can take it without me. Ha ha, he said. No one's taking this house without me. I waved goodbye from the jeep. Unbugyo ito, he shouted at me. His eyes were wide, a revelation. It's the typhoon, he said. He stood there in the yard with his labyrinth of chickens and the jeep revved up but stalled waiting for him to elaborate. Adina, sweet Adina, raised his finger up toward the heavens, the Pope amid his fowl. They know the storm is coming, he said. And all of these guys, hala, he said and he swept his hand over them, the spectacular creatures in their scattered places, Nemesio, Mariano, Bonifacio, Francisco, Jote, his male brood, Inihera, Waray sarabuta nanuk era bubuhatun, Hala, he said, these guys have no idea what to do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that was uh, delightful. Um, Shalja, you're next. Unmute. I'm going to read a five minute excerpt of the piece I have in this issue. It's titled To Uncover. And the background to it is that um, on November 5th, just over a month ago, a fuel tanker in Sierra Leone exploded on the road. Over 140 people were killed, 144 to be exact, and dozens were injured. The US, the world's largest producer of oil, actively blocks the transfer of green energy technology to Africa to, so that it could reduce or um, get off fossil fuel dependency. On April 20th, 2020, the US benchmark price for crude oil dropped below zero for the first time in history due to the drop in fossil fuel in fuel consumption caused by COVID lockdowns. One, it was a bright cold day in April and the clocks were striking apocalypse on Wall Street. On the 10th anniversary of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, the price of oil tanked, disappeared, went negative. Before screens all over the world, oil traders, stockbrokers, speculators in planetary extraction stared, numb and disbelieving as red lines plummeted. Oil barons wailed and howled and beat their breasts buried their faces in their hands and cursed and begged and prayed. Was there ever a time before oil? 
wasn't it always pumping up from the earth, thick and rich and viscous, filling hungry pipelines from Iraq to Nigeria to Ecuador? For market so loved the world, it sent its beloved oil across oceans in container ships larger than cities. Gasoline streaming into eager vehicles was the body and blood of oil, and whosoever ate of it would have eternal motion. Two, of course, there were the heretics. There are always heretics, unwashed, crazy, violent. They gathered in mobs, rioted in the streets, screaming, keep the oil in the soil. No blood for oil, no wars for profit. Bush, Major, we won't go. We won't fight for Texaco. Bush and Blair go to hell. We won't go to war for Shell. But the heretics only strengthened the faith of oil's people. The heretics had turned their backs on oil and their doom was self-evident. Oil's people paid their tithes to oil and knew they would inherit the earth. Three, apocalypse comes from the Greek apokalupsis, meaning revelation, and apokalyptain, to uncover. What does revelation ask of us? What must we do once we know? Four. It was a golden warm day in January 2009, and the clocks were striking apocalypse in Kenya's Rift Valley. A tanker carrying petroleum overturned on the Naivasha Highway. Crowds came running with jerry cans, with empty margarine tins, with plastic laundry tubs. With their bare hands, they scooped petrol into their vessels. And then the petrol exploded. A giant fireball swallowed over 100 people. The blessed ones, oil consumed entirely. From the less blessed, it took skin offerings, flesh offerings, whole limb offerings, left them marked forever with the sign of oil. Five, it was a dull chilly day in September 2011 and the clocks were striking apocalypse in Mukuru Sinai an informal settlement in Nairobi's industrial area. A pipeline running through Mukuru Sinai, carrying petrol to the leafy suburbs of Nairobi, sprung a leak. The desperate flocked to gather precious fuel. Someone flicked a cigarette into the rainbows of runoff in a drainage ditch. A wall of fire roared up. When the flames were doused, the ground was strewn with what looked like naked shop mannequins, imperfectly coated in tar, on their backs, knees and elbows bent. They weren't mannequins. The black was not tar. The white streaks visible under the black were not molded plastic. They were bone. Oil swallowed dozens of homes and 120 human beings. Thank you. Thank you. That was tremendous. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, finally, uh, we've got uh, Omar. Thank you so much, Roy. Thank you, everyone, for being here. It's, um, it's such a pleasure to be among these incredible authors uh, and to be in this issue. When, um, when Roy first asked me to be a part of this, I was thrilled. Um, He's one of the smartest people I know. And if, if you've ever met Roy, you know that it's very hard to leave a conversation with him um, and not feel much, much more intelligent and also much more depressed. Um, so I thought I might write him this short piece of fiction and try to return the favor and bum him out a little bit. Um, I'm just gonna read you the first few pages of, of um, the story I wrote for this issue. It's called Odds Making. Um, it's about a future where the wildfire season is, is a year long thing and you can go to betting houses and you can uh, bet on which cities are going to be next to burn, which towns are going to be next to burn. And when I first came up with this idea, I thought I was being very, very clever. And then I find out that, in fact, there are betting houses where you can take the over and under on temperatures at major cities. So I was not particularly clever. Um, so, yeah, this is from the beginning to about the first, the first third of the story. Three times the fire had come for him, but three times he lived. 
first in daughter paradise when he was a child, still unaccustomed to the relentless want of burning. What he remembers of the day now is the sight of the abandoned vineyards past the edge of town, high orange curls sprouting out the tops of sheds and the old tasting room. The whole of the world in the rear view mirror of the speeding truck, muddled and half melting, the way heat turns the image of a landscape watery, makes a still thing jitter. He remembers the sound his baby sister made next to him in the truck bed, cooing at the amber tendrils in the sky, the script of some strange and violent cursive, and his mother in whispered conversation with someone who wasn't there. To whom God's love commits thee here, to whom God's love commits thee here, as the town disappeared under black smoke. Fire does this, he learned, brings out the supplicant in all things. Twice more it came for him in his early adulthood, during the seasons he spent scabbing on the towers while the fire watchers union held out for a better deal. Back then the unionists used to crawl around the frontier with their brush cutters, cutting the power lines and snapping the satellite phone antennas. And sometimes the scab might go days or weeks unable to check in with the ranger's office. It happened to him the summer UC-72 tore through the northwestern edge of the valley. And by the time he caught sight of the plume churning out of Butte Creek, the fire had already rendered the sole logging road impassable. And so he ran blind through the brush and past the last standing redwoods and into the river. A year later, it would happen again near the place where Bowler Camp used to be. And once again, he'd escape, but not undamaged. For the rest of his life, he'd suffer from corseted lungs and carry a smooth pink scar that ran from his left shoulder down to his wrist. But he lived. It meant something to live. The bedding house overlooked the old county road that connected the valley towns to Bald Eagle Mountain. Once, when the burning season was still a passing thing, millions lived in this part of the country. But now only a few thousand stubbornly held on loggers and ruined looters, and those who remembered what it had once been like, and those who believed against all reason that it would be that way again, and those who chose to take their chances in the forest rather than the camps and the factories. Without judgment, the bedding house served them all. It was a pretty A-frame cabin in the style of the old National Park guidehouses, dolled up along its road-facing sign with a gaudy neon sign that flickered in electric pink action. Worm liked to get to the bedding house around dawn when it was still quiet. Although the marks usually started to line up outside around 10 in the morning, the book didn't officially open till noon. And before then, the only sound in the office was that of the spinning desk fans and the papers and maps rustling. It calmed him this part way quiet, allowed him to do his work. It was a common misconception that his job was to pick winners or losers towns that were most or least likely to burn. Even some of the Marks who'd been throwing their paychecks away at the betting house for decades still heckled him in the bar some nights when he'd failed to put an obvious burn site up on the board. Hey, Worm, how'd you go and miss that one? Don't your bum arm tingle with the wind or some shit? Don't you see the future? What they didn't understand is that the house never made money on clear winners or losers. His job was to find the coin toss towns the place is just as likely to burn as survive. That was the action that got the Marks excited, sent them arguing in the hall in wild disagreement as to whether the smart money would take the over or the under. The one thing the house liked better than coin toss towns was miraculous ones, places that seemed well out of harm's way but ended up burning, or places that stood right at the mouth of a fire but for some reason were spared. These were the picks that brought in big money. It was betting house tradition that every odds maker be nicknamed after the town that brought in the biggest haul of the book. And these coin toss towns were the picks that more often than not earned an odds maker his name. Thank you so much. Thank you, Omar. Uh, and uh, yeah, I wanna finish rereading that story again now. It's a really tremendous, uh, tremendous piece of work and we're I'm very lucky to have it. Um, thank you, um, and your, uh, your flattering comments as well, which I'll just uh, ignore. <laughs> um, so 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you all again, uh, Joseph, Gina, Shalja, and Omar. Uh, that was that was amazing. Um, we'll open it up now to to questions. Um, I suppose comments. Um, you can type your. I believe you you can type your questions into the the chat, or uh, there's a Q and A function where you can. Um, Put in questions, um, post your questions, and we'll we'll uh, moderate those as they as they come up. Um, I'll throw one out there to get us going. Unless you want, unless you have something, Noi, you you were you were thinking you'd like to get on the table. Yeah, I mean, I I guess one of the things that I that is most potent for me and listening to all of you read together is this question of witnessing the question of sort of receding into some uh, comfortable distance and witnessing whether you're witnessing snakes and ferrets and wolf spiders or chickens and sort of, sort of interpreting the, the, the re reactions of chickens or, or whether it's a coin toss town or whether people are scrambling with various vessels to get petroleum up off out of a out of a spill without recognizing the menace. So that sense of, of moving into a kind of safe distance um, that doesn't have that maybe and 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 just watching things happen. I wonder like how much um, how much you see those particular scenes that you're writing um, in the in the larger context of of or to if do you at, in the larger context of a kind of a of, of a of a global response to crisis. Um, is that sort of in effect what governments and populations are doing is just sort of crossing their arms and comfortably watching the wolf spider um, or the mouse take the head off the wolf spider? What's, what's, what is that distance? Well, where does it come from? Well, I'll dive in on that because I've spent a, a lot of um, my career as a writer interrogating the, the concept of witnessing and ultimately choosing solidarity over witnessing. There was, um, you know, there is this whole um, movement of the, the poetry of witness, which um, the poet Carolyn Forche coined that term, I believe. And I have always positioned myself not as a, a poet of witness, but a, a poet of solidarity and, um, called for and advocated a poetics of solidarity. And solidarity to me is a very different thing from witness. It demands active engagement. It demands recognizing one's own positionality and the limits of one's agency, as well as the responsibility of seeing and using one's positionality to act in whatever ways are possible. And um, you know, solidarity requires a, a constant state of critical dis discomfort and a, a constant demand on ourselves that we act, that we move in response to what we see. I would love to hear what my fellow, fellow panelists think. Yeah, I, I, can, I can speak a little bit to that discomfort um, at the same time, you know what Noi was talking about. Uh, I'm very aware of um, being away from my country, uh, especially um, my island. You know the the huge super typhoon that hit um, the Philippines um, <clears throat> and, uh, hit my island. It was called Heian. Um, and it hit my city, actually. So my novel ends with, I, I knew that this novel would somehow end with that typhoon, with that super typhoon. But, I, but I'll say this about how aware I am of the climate activists in the Philippines. So, I, so I'm hoping in, in talking about my novel, I, I definitely wanna talk about the fact that there are people in prison in Tacloban, my city, um, imprisoned by the dictatorship for being climate activists. There are all of these Warai people, Warai activists, uh, Cebuano activists, um, uh, activists all, all around the country that are doing work um, um, endangering themselves 
uh, for to to um to protest to act against um the you know um the weird things that the lots of you know the the Duterte dictatorship for instance is very tied to China. Um, which is very tired, very interested in the mining resources of the Philippines, you know, in my, in my, um, in my islands, towns, you know, there, I mean, something, salt mines, for instance, you know, so, and so that this kind of degradation of land um, that Filipinos are resisting and dying for and being in prison for, I'm very aware of that. And I'm, so I'm very aware in my novels of not being, of, I, I'm very aware that I'm a writer. I don't, I'm not, I'm not endangering myself with what I do. Um, and my job in my view is different um, in the sense that I, I have chosen what I do, which is write novels. A novelist remains a novelist. That's what you do is you're trying to just figure out how to get a story together. Um, but I decided with this novel to address, um, it's, it is very distressing to know that um, those people who are trying to save um, their country are being imprisoned by their country. And in writing about um, the environment, in writing about ending my novel at the very least with the issue of, of climate, I can talk about it. You know? So at the very least I can do that, but I do not pretend at all. I'm so aware of my separation and my distance and my safety. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm super, thanks y'all for the comments too. I'm super interested um, to part of what Shal just said about the, um, like thinking about the limits of agency and the kind of relationship, um, Nori, when you started this, this part of the inquiry about um, the relationships uh, between kind of people or populations and governments. Um, and I think that that's part of something, right, as like a writer who themselves is not necessarily in any sense of kind of like imminent danger, except for the kind of danger that one lives um, every day as any kind of uh, a marginalized subject. I hate the word marginalized because I think it's imprecise in so many ways, um, but uh, in, in the kind of um, sense of kind of um, consistent danger because of the way that we've kind of built a world system that is predicated on, on violence in the first place. Uh, I think that there's something about the kind of government and the populations thing whereby a lot of, I, I, I suppose I'm in a bit of a camp where I don't think there's any belief that any government will have, take any interest uh, in, in any way in um, uh, um, interjecting in, in a kind of like, not just preventative measure because that wouldn't necessarily be enough, but the kind of radical change that would be required in order to um, articulate a kind of difference. Um, but I do think that there are, of course, communal measures that folks take to reduce harm as they've always done. Um, and sometimes the different ways that that happens, um, there are these kinds of intersections that are missed um, with regards to like overlapping um, um, sources of harm within populations. So I'm really interested in this idea about like, of course, we know that um, the kind of increased um, like repetition of natural disasters are going to disproportionately fall on the poor. We know um, it, it, there is a certain kind of prediction predictability um, to these things. I was really interested in your story, Omar, thinking about um, the way that wagers and bets are placed on um, kind of the increasing, like deliberately increasing precarities of certain populations um, over and over again. Um, and I'm also really interested in, this is something that um, I talk about with, with family members, right? The kind of um, individuating impulse for people in marginalized communities to beat themselves up or to be beaten up at the level of the individual for not participating in or doing the quote unquote right thing. Um, like for example, you know, the day-to-day the -day recycling or something like that, right? Um, which, and you know, I live in Philadelphia in the suburbs of Philadelphia now, uh, townships which, right, uh, don't even like separate or, or take any real interest um, um, in, in recycling or any of these kind of like small individual measures and the dialogue around those things. So I, I think that there's really like a kind of muddling up of, of the discourse that uh, we have we have a long way 
um, perhaps to go on. Uh, I don't see any traction um, ever happening on that um, with regards to government, though, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, a few years ago, I was when I was still working as a journalist, I was down in, in Miami. I was writing a story about what some of the towns and cities around Miami are doing. Um, and one of the things that's happening in, in Miami is they're building this little sort of seawall. It's about sort of waist height. And, and this thing costs however many million dollars a kilometer. And uh, not only does it not stop hurricanes, it now doesn't stop those king tides, like particularly high tides will go over this thing now. And it's, it's becoming useless as they're building it. It's just very strange, like those old timey movie where, where the guy's putting the train track down as the train goes over the tracks. It feels a little bit like that. And so I was, I was writing about this. And at the same time, I found out that there was this European um, company that had its sales agents in Miami, and they were selling blueprints for these mansions, multi-million dollar mansions that were designed to float um, so that if the water rushed in, these houses would just rise up and they'd be okay. And it was the quintessential thing about sort of, I mean this in the worst possible way, but how perfect a system capitalism is, how incredibly resilient a system it is. Um, when there's one tree left, somebody will be able to sell it to somebody else sort of thing. And so I think whenever I think of the idea of, of sort of what I do now, which is make stuff up for a living, um, as, as witness, I do think of the kind of, the things I've seen and how they've drawn me to an inherently cowardly place where I, I run off into the future, I run off into the past, or I run off into these extrapolations of the world as it is, precisely because I don't think I have what it takes to properly witness something like that, which is a system so honed in on what it does well that you can't even describe it as malicious anymore. It, just, it moves to somewhere even beyond that. So in a sense, I think of what I do is by necessity having some aspect of witness, but my God, I'm very bad at it. Um, by its nature, it overwhelms me. Thanks for all those responses. Roy, did you wanna jump in with your question? There, there's a, a good, some good questions as well from um, audience, but why don't, why don't we, if that's, some way, a segue from the conversation we're having now. Yeah, go ahead. Sure, yeah. Well, I was, um, one, you know, one thing that I started thinking about in the, um, uh, during the reading was uh, the relation between the, the human and the non-human. Um, and this is, this is certainly one, one strand of um, discussion and, and uh, one line of approach on how we deal with the, ecological crisis uh, and the, the transformation that, that we're living through. Um, some people argue that there's a need for um, a, a more uh, embedded kind of vitalist thought, um, a more kind of thing that, that recognizes and respects the non-human world um, to, to a greater degree. And, and I certainly find that somewhat persuasive uh, but at the same time, um, I, I'm more inclined, uh, you know, going going back to what I guess sort of in line with what Omar is saying about uh, capitalism. I think there's a sense in which we're we're already we never stopped being vitalist in our thought, or to you know, uh, in the words of like Bruno Latour, right? We've never been modern, right? We um, we've never stopped believing that the world around us has a kind of agency and power. Um, it's just that maybe we, we worship the wrong spirits or we have the wrong kinds of relationships with, with um, our animals um, or they're occluded in some way or um, the structures that we live within alienate us. But, but to sort of come around to the, to the point on this, um, I wanted to ask all of you, this is because this is a question I, I think about is what can what can language do and what can the kind of aesthetic practice of language that we do um, broadly uh, do to to transform or open up um, uh, the human relation to the non to the non-human. 
what can what can language do to um, disturb or or reform or or even to enlighten us in, in that? Or how do you see it do it? How do you see it happening in your work? Maybe. Sorry, go ahead. I'm thinking, yeah, right now, what can language do is we're, we're literally modeling it and playing it out in this space where all of us who just read are doing language and the people who are attending this session, people who logged in and are giving an hour of their lives to be in conversation here are also doing language and to be human is to want to communicate and to want to connect and language is how we find our people language is how we find those we are in solidarity with and those we want to build with and those we want to make movement with it's what gathers us and what we see and know over and over again in the face of climate crisis is that human beings come together in mutual aid and they come together in solidarity and they save each other and language is part of how we do that. I think that, um... You know, maybe in my like most optimistic, I, I or my most, most hopeful, because I think hope and optimism are, are different. At my most hopeful, I think of language doing something similar, you know, the way Godfrey's feedback has this line about like the non conscious reorganization of uh, reorientation of desires. It's what like humanities pedagogy um, uh, can or should do at its best. I think of uh, perhaps language participating in that. Um, in the sense that there is a way that, you know, uh, for me or for me in reading and, and what I would like to do in, in writing, right, is to provide other ways to think about attachment or other things to be attached to. Which is why I'm, I'm so interested in writing about um, love and care and all of these ways and how, how difficult it is. And the fact that like all of the things that we do wrong um, or ways that are like kind of minor and uh, a grand kind of like perpetuations of violence or what have you are usually done I think when you know if we give people's like kind of best intentions uh, uh, any any respect with the intention of love right or care or the idea that um, you know we are we are this is the best way that we can go on or continue on in anything um, and I think that one of the things that language does or that language has done for me is kind of force me to try and think about um, different ways uh, of doing that, or of participating in attachments with, with other people um, and things, right? As difficult as that might be, right? Perhaps it might not even all it get you all the way there, right? You, you know, I, I kind of, I'm very frustrated with uh, the kind of idea that one can go and read a text and then turn around and change your life tomorrow. This like kind of magical um, preschooly idea about what what reading and literature does. I don't, you know, uh, it's very frustrating to me. But I think that. Um, uh, uh, tempering uh, the excess of desires that we have for things that are not necessarily working um, is something that language can help us do and something that's, that's useful. Joseph, one thing I, I think of when, when you say that, talk about the, the sort of the magical transformation that language might provide, that seems to me bound to a notion of capitalism and this is kind of speedy speedy transmutation, speedy recovery. And, um, and now I wonder if one, one of the things that language offers us is a way of um, disrupting time or disrupting progress, um, creating a gaze that says, we don't have to move forward. We don't have to participate. So I, I just, that's just a thought I'm throwing out there. Yeah, thank you for that, Noe. I mean, yeah, like, progress writ large is, is, a, is a problem. I've talked to Roy about this before too, right? Like the idea that we think that there's any any way forward at all um, is probably something that we should slow down and try to get home to. Um, there's, a, there's a question coming in from the panel, uh, from the audience. Um, 
does climate change, uh, and I don't mean to interrupt or dislodge this conversation, if Gina and Omar, if you wanted to the, be, address that, this, this, this issue, please make a little signal. Very good, okay. All right, I just wanted to, to honor the um, audience questions. Um, the question is, does climate change trump war or does war trump climate change in terms of frames for imagination? or that imagination engages. And I think there's a kind of, I think, um, endearing um, undercutting of that question and asking, is the question ill-posed? So the question really is, is this about the, the uh, I guess the importance of hierarchy of, of war and climate change is one thing more important than another um, in terms of frames for imagination. War is climate change. The US military is the single largest polluting entity on the planet. Its carbon footprint exceeds that of 140 other countries. So there is no way that we can begin to address climate change without addressing militarism and without dismantling militarism. So it's a, a false dichotomy. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly certainly inclined to agree. Um, I think one of the, the central differences, again, from my frame as a guy who makes stuff up, is is the notion of what the language tool set and the creative tool set is for addressing or setting a story in each of those contexts. Um, one of those, um, by virtue of the creative work that for centuries has existed around it, um, has a much more overt hierarchy of suffering. Um, when, when, I, when my writing takes me to places that cause me to write about war, I am by virtue of the books I've read over the course of my life, the things I've seen, the places I've lived, I've had this thing ingrained into my head as to the hierarchy of suffering. I've seen people with names like mine and with ethnicities like mine essentially be relegated to the bottom of that of that particular hierarchy in, in the sort of longest lasting wars of my lifetime. <clears throat> um, whereas with something like climate change, that hierarchy also exists. It's not nearly as overt, but there is a hierarchy of suffering of who is going to be made to suffer first and whose suffering is going to, is going to be the marker at which the people in charge of this world decide to actually take significant action. Unfortunately, by the time those people begin to suffer, a lot of us will have died and that snowball will be much further down the hill. So I don't think of them as, as being separate from one another. I mean, you look at something like Syria where there, there was a drought and, and a, a full on destruction of livelihoods of so many farming lives, farming families, human beings who depended on this that preceded what we all know now is as the war, the civil war, the, the hot conflict, the guns, the bombs, et cetera, those things are not, there's not a chasm between those things. I do think there is a chasm of how overt the hierarchy of suffering is between them. And I think that's what makes them a little, um, what makes it easier to, to impose something like that kind of dichotomy. I don't, I don't think I believe in it though. I feel like there, there's more, to, a lot more to say about that, and um, particularly those who who've written about war or been um, Roy, you for instance. I would think you you might want to, as a, as a as a participant in the conversation, want to say something about that. Not to put you on the yeah, spot. sure. No, I can. I mean, I I write on war and climate change, um, um, like like Omar and others. Um, yeah, and in some sense, what um, Shalja and Omar have been saying, I think I I, I agree with that. There's, um, as as political events in the world, they're definitely um, war drives climate change, especially in in our you know current military industrial complex uh, with our current structures. Um, 
fossil fueled um, armies and so on and so on jet fighters with their you know afterburners burning thousands of gallons of fuel in minutes um and that sort of thing um and at the same time uh climate change is going to drive war right as omar uh, uh adverted with uh reference to the to the syrian conflict um and we'll see we are seeing we will see more and more of that uh, from uh resource conflicts to um you know conflicts that emerge out of uh drought and agricultural failure to um conflicts over migration um yeah they, as events they go together uh it, they're inextricable um in our in the emergent um predicament that we are in the very early stages of in terms of representation and and, and genre um i think um one of the interesting distinctions i think that can be made is that um at least in in most representations of war i can think of particularly in the contemporary era war is um is an other place it's uh it's a place that it, it's another place or another time uh it's either it's either something that happens to us uh if it's um if it's a war it's if, it, if it's a story of war in a country that's been invaded or it's a it's a story of going to a war and coming back um or inflicting war on others and and then the aftermath of that um so it's it's an other place and and it's always in relation to peacetime um in some sense um and i think one of the things that we're struggling to make sense of when when it comes to climate change is that that doesn't exist um there may be you know there there are disasters and and catastrophes as discrete events um you know with their decades long ramifications um but but there's no but as for the as for the transformation that we're living through the planetary ecological transformation that we're living through there's no there's no outside to it there's no other there's no other place to compare it to uh, no you know except perhaps the past um so that's uh that's i think an interesting difference to think about in terms of a narrative um construction and the narrative challenges that poses right it's um there's a tendency i think sometimes um you know one of the struggles with with figuring out how to represent climate change is how to not let it reduce just to an event that happens and then it and then is over and we're on the other side but how do we see it in 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 terms of a uh, in terms of what it is which is planetary transformation um with all the you know subsequent effects um yeah uh, that's what i would say um i want to respond to something that um dora is bringing up in the chat there's um uh, a way so a war is is nation it's a human to human and nation to nation um struggle uh conflict and and the question that or the the point that um uh, one of the audience members is making is that is that we're not just talking about humans um right that the the, the climate the ecological devastation that we're witnessing that we're that we're participating in um starts with you know the smallest whatever the the um the smallest marine uh creature up to the um you know the largest the largest land animal where we're we're affecting and decimating populations beyond beyond the human um and i think that 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 question of i mean i'm, I'm fascinated to think of in um joseph's uh reading and then and then um, you're you're re 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 reading gina um the kind of prominence of the non-human uh and the kind of dependence interdependence and inner uh, kind of the, the the qualities of and necessities of observing the other than human um so I, I wanted to just open open to that conversation that um 
an audience uh, Dora has, has brought up. Like, what do we learn? What do we know? Um, coming around to your question, what does revelation ask of us? Um, Salja, that question you have, is there, is there revelation that we depend on from the, the other than human, the beyond human that um, we are need to answer? How are you answering it? What are some examples of answering it? Well, I'm going back to Jim's land acknowledgement where he pointed out that if as a species we had listened to and followed the lead of indigenous peoples on this land, we wouldn't be in this position that we're in now. And as much as climate crisis or addressing climate crisis requires us to dismantle militarism, it also requires us to relinquish human supremacy which is um, an even more monumental task to decenter ourselves on this planet and to actually come into proper relation with all other forms of life on this planet. But we know it's possible because indigenous peoples have been doing it for millennia. They've been the stewards of all the lands that we live on and all the territories that we inhabit. And we still have those models, we have those blueprints, we have those histories. And um, this feeds back into the question about language, what can language do and what does language do? One of the things that the reclaiming and the transmission of indigenous languages does is teach us how to be in relation to the world in a completely different way. So there's such an extraordinary wealth of learning and possibility there for us if we're willing to engage with it fully. Yeah, um, I, that's for me, uh, Shelja, that's exactly, that's all I've been thinking of during this whole conversation. It's just returning mm -hmm. to, um, e even in the United States, just the solidarity with the indigenous, you know, with the land back, with, um, with, the, with, the, with the concerns of the indigenous. I think that's that's really the way to go at, at the very least in this in in, in this American uh, continent. I think that indigeneity for me has been kind of the way into even thinking about the genres, the texts that one would be looking at. I think for me, there's not. I mean, I I remember reading uh, Powers Overstory. You know that it won the Pulitzer a few years ago, and I was really shocked. <laughs> there was not a single indigenous uh, person in the novel, and I, it may have been very deliberate. I don't know the um, the 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 frame of Richard Powers, but but again, that um, uh, such powerful storytelling that completely misses the mark in thinking about settler colonialism in that novel, for instance, and kind of this interesting, very white concept of um, how to view America with these um, planting of these trees, these chestnuts, I don't know what they're, but, but if, if it had centered more on, on, on what America is, which is this kind of this, uh, genocidal state of uh, where you have, again, a, a great novel, a Pulitzer novel that um, completely ignores the indigenous and a story about ecology and a story about the environment. And I think it's this absence of the indigenous voice um, that in, in like general, you know, popular, the popular imagination or the what's um, what we tend to look at, you know, the books that we tend to um, to honor, et cetera, et cetera, that I think um, it's a huge loss for America that we're not centering um, indigenous cultures. I think it's a problem. And thinking of dis uh, Asaja, were you going to say something? I see you're unmuted. Oh no, um, no. I 
don't want to talk over anyone, but I also want I want I want to move the conversation along so that we are um, making we just are present for for what I mean. There's so many ways that the conversation is moving and can move. Um, so please, Roy, others of you, if you have questions, I mean, you're you're I suppose feeling here you're here to answer questions, but you are also I invite you to pose questions as well, all of you, any of you. Um, so where are we, um, where do we look? I guess a question I have is, is, is I hear your complaint, Gina, about um, the Powers novel and the centering, the, or the centering of, the, of the, uh, that imagination, um, which is exclusive or partial. Um, so where do you look to the other artists, other writers, other thinkers, um, makers? Um, where are the places you all are looking for fortification, or where do you look when you're feeling like you need you need um, you need somebody to animate you? You need to stoke the fire. Where do you where do you go? For me, when I think of um, the if I'm thinking about this problem, you know, climate environment, I would go to. I love the indigenous scholars. I think the scholars um, that I've been reading, Rachel Bryant. Um, just, just their ways of thinking about historiography or ways of re, I, I, it's like I'm relearning what, um, what this, uh, what this America is, you know, because it's a really, um, I think, profound, very sophisticated um, way of thinking about history, as, uh, because it's so tied to land. I mean, it's so tied to how one how the how they view themselves in terms of plants and animals and and land and so and it's such a i i find that reading these scholars um it, uh it, they they really shift my own relationship to the earth and to land not in not in and i'm saying this not in a not in a sentimental way, but the intellectual work that they're doing, because it's completely always reflexive. You know, it's always about um, because they all the the way I read them, the way I I what I love about the kind of especially the historiographic work that they're doing is they always have to figure out how they were how they they've been misread, um, how they how they're how they have to reread the texts about them. And kind of this, ref that, so this reflexivity, I mean, uh, Sh Shelley, you're talking about the um, uh, use, the, the reorienting using indigenous languages, because they will speak, um, they will have terms that uh, about their orientation to the land that, um, that really shows, in my view, just hugely, um, uh, different ways of relating to themselves, to other, to um, to the earth, etc., to time. Um, a different. The, the, I mean, so I, I for this particular issue, I go to. I would go to indigenous scholars. I just find them find them fascinating. I mean, I because I do a lot of Philippine history, so I do a lot of uh, research on Philippine history. But as I've been reading the indigenous scholars, I should have been reading them from the beginning as opposed to, because I'm only learning about them later. Um, because I've been reading white, uh, a lot of um, histories about the Philippines are, are white. And there is simply no reflexive way of thinking in white history. It's very difficult for white historians to, to think with reflexively. And for the indigenous scholar, it's just, it's just what, it's just how they think. It's just so organic to, to think about mistranslation, to think about um, how the other is reading the other. Um, uh, and so it's, it's really revelatory for me. I wondered about the question of text, text, and text heaviness. What uh, Gosh talks about uh, with that, just like we're a text heavy culture. Um, you talk about indigenous scholars, we can go to a text by a scholar. We're immersed, a lot of us, most of us, in 
um, some academic sphere, a literary sphere? Is there, um, is there motion beyond or, or do you, in what ways do you move beyond um, the, the word on the page for solace, um, for instruction? I want to tie um, your this question noise to the your previous one about what do we turn to or what do I turn to to, to light a fire right now or to to seek um, solace you know, combining those two things and right now it feels to me really critical that we create space for grief for unmitigated and uncensored and unrestricted grief about where we are as a species and what we're losing and what we're seeing all around us, the collapse of systems, of societies, of civilizations, the enormous human suffering. Um, Mary Ann Hegler, the climate writer, published a great essay in The Nation recently on climate grief and how it's supposed to hurt and we should refuse the the demands that you mentioned Roy though or I don't recall if it was you or or Noi um the demand for hope and optimism and how do we move forward because what this time calls for is mass collective grief and there is something powerfully unmaking and anti-capitalist about grief which is why capitalism so resists and suppresses mass expressions of grief. In the space of grief, we actually have to confront our mortality and the mortality of those around us and the end of everything we know. And we have to confront our own helplessness and our own fear. And we have to sit with it and not reach for all the, the forms of self-medication that capitalism offers us, so the forms of consumerism with which we distract ourselves from seeing the reality that we're in. So right now I actually see the work of grief as urgent and fertile space for us to enter into and explore and examine fully and give our, our best energies and our, our best thinking to. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think that um, if you, uh, I, I feel like we're, we, we should um, probably wrap up pretty soon, but I wanted to think about grief in relation to, I, Joseph, I see your children behind you um, doing uh, little just dances and, and having a little joyous expression. And I think about children, the obligations, if, the question of moving, I have an activist friend who is disgusted with people moving toward grief so soon after having um, embedded themselves in, in indifference. So they're moving from indifference to grief and um, uh, eliding any furious activity, you know, the, the action that might come of fury. And I think about the obligations of parenthood. So the, the, the obligations of parenthood, um, does that change the equation for folks? Do you move? I mean, I can imagine for Joseph sitting grieving in front of those beautiful children, what that might sound like to, um, to, to children looking for fortitude and guidance. Yeah. Not to, um, I, I, I respect your, respect your, your, um, your your position there, Salja, and I and I, I share it as well. I feel it. But I wanted to just wonder about that for a minute, and then maybe close out after that. Mm -hmm. It is interesting, you know, what you said, Salja, about the. I, I just wonder what what were the books. I, I'm I'm really wondering right now what are the books that are coming from the pandemic. I do know that with my own self, I ended up I ended up writing a book. It was a book supposed to be about the Philippine American war. It ended, it ended up being a book mourning my mother. It was very odd, you know, I completely changed my novel during the pandemic um, and it became a, a book about mourning. Um, I just wonder about that, um, the, this issue of, of um, the move into mourning, the move into grief and just being, it's something I don't do actually. I just, uh, a whole novel just about my mother. Um, 
I never do personal things, but I just wonder about um, that move into the personal as a resistance kind of to the, um, um, it's almost like a weirdly impersonal just because of the safety that you have, um, the way you're dealing with the pandemic. And it's kind of a resistance allowing it to, to move into, move into your body by writing about grief. Yeah, I mean, there's a, I'm sorry, I was, I have stuff I wanted to say, I was like trying to say it one because we're talking um, in the background. I think um, I'm really, I'm really interested in the idea that grief can be part of this like kind of binding agent that is um, inherently anti-capitalist. Uh, as well, I'm worried about the way that grief has been used uh, politically to mobilize uh, more reactionary or conservative movements, kind of um, typically. Um, but I think, you know, I think that with any kind of um, conveyance of emotion, that's like possible, right? And if and if and if any and if anything, grief is perhaps um, the kind of uh, most useful uh, with regard to like kind of slowing down and taking pace. Yeah. So one one second. Um, with kind of um, slowing down and try and kind of thinking about um, pace a little bit um, and and loss in a real way rather than kind of um, uh, moving on to the next thing uh, like continuing to collect and to gather um, uh, and to organize the new. So I think that that is useful. To the other question, I was thinking about this as well um, about the kind of organizational hierarchies that may include non-human. Um, I think a lot about uh, somebody like Zakia Iman Jackson's work, um, someone who was thinking about the fact that like, you know, there are problems with all of the, the kind of major frameworks by which we thought about um, non-human relations, particularly like um, object oriented, oriented ontology, et cetera, that kind of ignore the way that um, particular races, especially black people have already been turned into this kind of like um, animalistic form. Or, or, or signified over and over again, and whether or not um, uh, redelineating hierarchies with uh, and about the non-human will actually do anything um, with regards to that. So I think that I have a little bit of skepticism there, even as, of course, like I'm, I'm trying to write, uh, you know, the natural world into the work um, more often. Uh, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm just not always sure about. Um, about, about the angle of it. And I think it, it's kind of most popular forms. It, it tends to be a little bit, uh, I tend to be a little bit more suspect of it. To the, the question of indigeneity, I was thinking about too, um, Leslie Mormon Silk, I was thinking about ceremony quite specifically. Um, and thinking about this question through the character Tayo in, uh, in ceremony, who, right, is someone who undergoes this like quite literal, um, almost war hero transformation, um, Roy, it's something that you have written about a, a lot, right? Uh, but then is kind of trans, it kind of ends up transforming back into a kind of relationship um, with the land that tends to be a, a source of healing. Um, and I think that may, you know, maybe that's like one interesting way uh, to think about this, this conversation about how you um, have a relationship to, to the land and to um, the people, places, um, uh, things around you in and outside of, of kind of displacement. Thank you for that. And thank you all of you uh, and Dora also for your um, questions or your, your uh, assertion of the, the need for the liturgies of lament that, that, that bring us to a new language um, uh, and to remember the language of the body as well as the, uh, the languages that we, under, that we identify as language. Um, so thank you for all of, all of your, your thoughts and, um, and ways to move um, there are uh, ways to, to the order pre-ordering of the of the climate issue, uh, which includes all this great work that you've heard tonight and uh, much much more. Um, and Roy's amazing introduction to the issue um, is all available at that link that Jim just sent. So please find it. Um, stay in the conversation. Stay strong. Take care of yourselves. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And Jim wanted us to mention also that the uh, recording is going to go up on the YouTube channel if you want to watch it again. Um, there it is. Or if you want to share that with people or 
I don't know, use it in a course or whatever. But I also wanted to to add my thanks um, to uh, Jim for for originally, you know, sort of making this, asking uh, us to do this and make it happen, and um, everyone who's been a part of it. Um, Noi tonight, uh, Emily and uh, Eddie was Eddie the the other guy who was helping with tech. Um, thank you, and especially our our readers tonight, uh, Gina, Shalja, Omar, and uh, Joseph. It's um, some of you are friends. Some of you I hope will be friends. Uh, but it's been a, a real. Um, I, pleasure is not entirely the right word given the heaviness of the topic, but um, it's been really meaningful. And uh, I've, uh, you know, I, I think about these questions all the time, and it's always um, a relief, honestly, to come together with other people who um, who are facing facing the fullness of our predicament. Um, and uh, thank you, thank you for that. Thank you for that, uh, to take Shalja's word, solidarity. Thank you everybody, it's great to meet y'all. Thanks for everybody for coming as well.